So uh, I work in memory care. Oh and, yeah. And we have a resident who can't speak. She can understand commands, and oh. open, but can't actually speak. She usually communicates by screaming. Is that usually? It's not bad screaming. It's kind of oh. scream. Oh. Okay. Um, is that usually what's going on? Is that that speech that? Probably the Broca's area, yeah. So it's been a while. So is Alzheimer's, you don't know what kind of dementia? Right. It's like a it's description of symptoms, and so everyone's dementia is always different. Mm -hmm. Do you, but you don't know if like she's had lots of strokes. So dementia is a general term for brain-related damage that causes function, uh, memory or personality function, right? The most common is Alzheimer's. The second most common is multi-infarct or a lot of strokes. Do you ever hear like, you, you know, you take grandma after the stroke and they say, you know, the, the doctor puts the brain scan up and says, oh, tell me about the first stroke. What? Because some of them are small enough that you don't notice in terms of function, but there's so some, so those, the pattern is different. Yeah. And We've got an array, like we had somebody with Louie body. Mm, that's the third most common, yeah. And that was a hard one. And it's always fascinating what's actually happening. Mm-hmm create an event when they're going through a, a movie body moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the one I know the least about in terms of the brain off the top of my head. Because I'm wondering why they're seeing Because he would be in a boxing ring. Right. Obviously, he was in a dining room. Mm -hmm. He was in a boxing ring just decking other residents. It's just wow. like, what do you see? What are you doing? And there are more hallucinations associated with Louis body than the other dementias. Mm -hmm. And one would assume it's the, the visual area back here that's had the damage. So Alzheimer's and, and strokes are easier. Alzheimer's tends to follow a basic pattern. It starts with the hippocampus, moves to the temporal lobe, and then goes to the frontal and parietal lobes. So the key piece here is it gets that kind of basic memory, that the, this, this ongoing memory. Uh, you forget your keys or cell phone? Is that, ex is that a symptom of Alzheimer's? If you say, oh, this is funny. Look at this. Yeah. Oh, this is funny. Look at this. You don't remember, you don't have the memory of noticing something that was just right there a moment ago. That's kind of a classic hippocampal sign. Um, uh, people will turn the stove on and walk away, so it starts to get real serious. People get, then you, you, you keep going and people get lost in their own neighborhood. Keep going and people don't rec recognize, they're driving, they don't recognize what a stop sign is. Right. And so it starts from the hippocampus, goes out to the temporal lobes. The hippocampus is that immediate piece, but it also means once that damage starts, it's hard to get new memories in. This is why people start, you know, talking about things, and you look like you're, you, you know, we, you come in, and it's really your, we, your mom, your grandmother thinks you're your dad, not you, because he looked like you 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So it starts growing out. Once it gets to the parietal and frontal lobe, that's where the, the personality change starts, right? Um, so that's Alzheimer's. Strokes depend upon where the strokes are. And you know, many people multi, they have small and large ones. And I don't know how much you know about strokes. So they're, um, they're, they're bursting of a blood vessel. If the blood vessel is way out here towards the end, then you can see that these are dried up blood vessels. This one has a mess on that's easy to see, right? All of these here. Some of them are big enough that you can, you probably know, like you can almost stick a stick inside, right? You can almost, See, these are the smaller ones out to the outside. And then, you know, it gets down to even teenier ones there. But, like, there's a couple of them that have. There's a, I, I remember somewhere a couple, and you can see the whole. Is it though. that one? Yeah. Oh, yeah, look at these sticking out. Yeah. You know, we're just a little perfect, so it's beyond the tape. Yeah. So this one you can see. So if it's like, if you have a stroke here, it's going to perfuse all the way through this area and then depends on how long it's caught, how much of the area that kills it, just the same way I mentioned with Clyde Waring. If it's over here, it's going to be more localized and you'll see it in a specific area. Um, and then if it's smaller there, and if somebody's having multiple ones, you can, you can at least begin to diagram where it is. Oh, I think I have an example of a stroke. Go back to the main area. Go back. Uh, yeah, okay, so go down. Yeah, there you go. One sec. Yeah, or, uh, keep going down. Where it comes up? Uh, there you go. This is a stroke. Excellent. So this is from the Harvard Whole Brain Atlas, an excellent site I recommend. It has normal anatomy or a normal brain, and it has a lot of cases. It has some dementia cases, and it has strokes and a variety of others. So this is cool because you can see pretty easily, these are the same slice, where is the...
just use this one. Where's the problem? Is it just in terms of directions? Is it on the top, bottom, left, or right? Right, top, middle, or bottom? Middle. It's right there. It's pretty obvious. Go to the next slide. This is the same brain. I know it's all that. There you go. This is the same brain. Either one slide. Click there. You go. Yeah. Lower one side. So one literally one slice lower. Can you see it? I can't. So, so strokes really vary in size and in, in stroke. But you can begin to, depending upon how much, um, you know, how much, uh, what do you call, picture taking. There's an intelligent word for that. But, you know, you could see somebody has, oh, I think there's one. Go to, keep going. That's, all, that's late stage. This is late stage Alzheimer's. Actually, I don't know if it's earlier or less. No, um, yeah. There's one that's more... So uh, that's stroke. Oh, this one. Okay, here. This is where he fell. This is a guy who fell from a second. He was two years old. He fell from a second story uh, patio down to a cement pad below in an apartment building. This is the metal plate that was put in his head. So that's a that's a CT. That's for the skull. This is you see how much of his brain. I mean, that's obvious. And sometimes you see with stroke something almost that large, particularly again if if it has an um, you know, with uh. Jill Bolte Taylor was about 40 minutes before she got help. And you know that the fast, was it face, arm, speech, and the fourth is time, right? Time lost is, is, is cell loss. So this is a huge, these by the way, the ventricles, just as a, you know, so they're quote empty, again, gray and dark, but you know. Um, and there's a whole lot to how the pictures get made that have to do with I don't know, tons of detail, computers and varieties of weightings. So you can't trust the colors. By the way, just as an aside, um, you've probably seen this in medical pictures. I don't know of the brain. They always take them from the bottom up. So left is right and right is left. So you'll see this. The problem with learning about psychology is a lot of the materials are made for the lay audience. So they flip them, which help regular people. But if you're used to seeing medical stuff, then switch to non-medical. You always have to double check is left, right, or right, left. So that's just, so some of them are small like that one, some are huge like this, and somebody, if they've had a, a multi-infarct dementia, then they probably had a combination of small and large, some at one area, some at other areas of the brain. So yeah. Yeah, I would think, I know in schizophrenia they show people who have auditory and visual hallucinations, they literally have more activity in the auditory and visual cortex. So when you say it's not real, that's not an accurate statement. Right, um, it, 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 it stimulates stuff in the visual cortex, the, in the auditory cortex. So it feels real, right? It feels real. There's another example there. It was related to that, but I forget. Oh, and man, I, I, I took, I, I went on a tour of Manor Care, which was also a, a memory care facility over on Orchard in like 66th or something. And they do something called reality therapy. And, and part of it is, if you believe it, we go along with it. And, and particularly for the later stages, because people spend a lot of time going in and out of being conscious or, or being here with us. As opposed to somebody who's early where you're gone for a while and then you come back, they, they spend a, as, almost as much time transitioning as they do in either wherever their mind is or in this reality. So if you believe it, we do it. Um, now, if you keep waking up and being surprised that you live in a room with people that are not related to you and eating in a, in a uh, place where you're eating next to other people who you have some vague familiarity with, because you've seen them like for the last year or two, but you don't recognize them, what real life situation does that mirror? Where do you, ha where do you ha eat in a common room? School, if you're doing in prison, right? Prison, school, excellent, right? You know the one they use? Cruise ship. You have a little cabin. You come to the same spot. Now, if you had a choice in order. So you start with what they're familiar with, right? You know? Um, but they, so they literally would have that. They said, yeah, oh, you're, this is your stateroom. And they would have people sign, like, put your room number, sign just to make it feel like, because it made sense. So then, and, and making that big sense, and this is where you think about the pathways, if, if, if you're not upset about where am I, what am I doing, then you can process direct individual details. She said something funny, I laughed, the food tastes good or bad. Notice the questions 
are you enjoying the food do not require any comparison to the past or future. How are you today does. Because it implies what? How are you today? Right. Or is this a good day or bad day for you? How are you yesterday, et cetera, so on. With Clive Waring, the, the, you can see videos on the internet like that where they teach him to say, oh, look, the sun's shining. Not, oh, the weather got better. And working with people with memory care. So by providing a big context that makes sense enough, you allow the rest of your brain because they're to do what it's supposed to do and interact with people. What's amazing is that there is no central place that runs the rest of it. People would like to think it does. The, the spot, so the, um, you know, the amygdala, the bulb is right in, and it would, you know, if we kept going in there, so this is hippocampus, where are we at? Yeah, that's probably hippocampus, but shortly after, if I kept sticking my finger in there, it would be amygdala. So that's making the fight or flight decision. This part of the brain, the one right here, that's why the parents worry about the, the head, front head hits, you know, whether it's soccer or football or, or tripping over your bike, this is the one that manages and, and it, um, inhibits impulses. For example, you signed up for classes so that you could pay money, so that you could buy books with your money, so that you could spend time doing something somebody else, when somebody else told you to be there, so that then you could spend your evenings and weekends studying. If we just put it that way, what kind of deal is that? A shitty one. What's the, so your amygdala is like, Right? I mean, really. One student said, every time I have to say no in order to, to no, I have to study. No, I have to do this. No, I can't afford that. So I got to buy books. She's, you know, it's bing, bing, bing. This one says, yeah, but why are you doing it? I don't know. Couldn't think of anything better to do. <laughs> Come on, okay, my one have some nice, rich, inspirational story. I've always wanted to go to college. It matters to me. I feel like a better, no? Really? Why in school? I mean, you take it, why are you taking biology class? That's hard. Money. Why do you have to, to get a job, to get money? When are you going to get that money? Like, at the end of the class? Aaron going to pay you? <laughs> he paid the last class. No. <laughs> Later in life. So what? So my kids can enjoy it. Exactly. That's massive amount of, of impulse control. Impulse, impulse control is the most fundamental feature when we talk about psychology in the brain, the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, right? This is the total frontal cortex right up here, but the prefrontal, ten, they tend to talk about right there, and physically there's pathways right in there. Sadly, so, so the, well, there's a lot of things about that. The development of that, the, the, the conversation between the, you know, the internal voice in here and the amygdala, which is talking faster and based on simpler ideas of dangerous or not, right? I can't control that. It gets, it, it's first. It gets the first conversation. I walk into a situation and go, ah! I mean, you walk into a situation and look at a bright light. That's usually not a good thing, right? You walk in with a bright light and medical instruments, and people say, we, we haven't gotten a brain in 20 years. I mean, I'd be worried. Um, but uh, balancing and having that, that, it gets the first voice. Your cortex gets the second voice. When you flip over the test and look at the first question, your limbic system responds first. Your cortex has to respond to the limbic system. When we talk about stress management strategies, oh, I just won't get anxious. That's just a load of crap. I will have an anxious immediate reaction and I will have a response to that. That we can train in your cortex and that back and forth. So there's argue, they've looked into it for autism as, a, as one of the pathways that isn't developed. They've looked at it with uh, psychopaths or serial killers who, who struggle. And there's, I don't want to say those are the same. I'm, I'm saying that this fundamental pathway seems to be that beginning piece between the limbic system and the cortex that really runs a lot of, um, a lot of, it's, it's the centerpiece of human behavior. Um, what about bipolar disorder? I, say what? Bipolar disorder. That's a great question. Um, there's a strong genetic loading. Is there specific areas in the brain? Depre well, we'll start with this. This is the left, left side. The left inner side. So when we talk about emotion, intense emotion, right? Limbic system provides, the amygdala is like dangerous or not. And it also is comforting or not in that grandma's, if your grandma was nice, and you know, that gentle, you know, cookies baking in the oven, oh, she's there. That's an amygdala level emotion. But most of us have more complicated emotions. This 
inside right here is where what they say meaning is bestowed on emotion. That means, you know, you have a day and then you say, how was it? My favorite example, have you ever had a discussion with somebody you care about and you describe it to somebody else and they say, wow, what a fight. And you're like, we weren't fighting. And you're like, sounds like a fight. <laughs> right. Earlier today. Uh, and so, right, am I annoyed, upset, exasperated, totally done, or just mildly irritated? The amygdala doesn't make those distinctions. Right? I think of the amygdala like the primary colors of emotions, but these are like the, uh, you know, the bone, acru, white, and egg, all those kinds of things, the variations of you know, rosé versus red versus blah, 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 all the, the, the catalog colors. Right? What does it mean? And so when we talk about the, the connection between those two, um, and I want to be clear, I, I'm giving you metaphorical because I haven't seen specific research where it says more or less activity in one area because of manic depression, bipolar disorder. You've seen some, like in ADHD, in the upper part of the limbic system in here. Um, yeah, it's funny because it's very biological. But yeah, off the top of my head, I'm, you know, it's based on what I know as an introductory psych teacher, it's not as prominent as schizophrenia or some of the others which have more located. So, so take that for what it's worth. And, and, and uh, you guys know Medline's free. Medline is the, uh, PubMed is the um, database for medical articles. So if it's funded through any kind of US government research, they have to put the, the, uh, the abstract there. It's great if you, you know, somebody has cancer or something you want to look up. Um, and it's also great for that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll look. I don't think there's a specific area. But that connection between intense energy and what it means is one of the problems. There's also evidence, so this is where we think about our emotions. So for depression, there's some evidence that in this area, there's more, uh, more activity for people who are depressed. And this is where we think about our emotions. So you could say stew with it or, or perseverate's a great word. You know, your friend, you take them out to coffee and say, how are you doing? Six hours later, they pause. Um, but over on the outside, where, where we take emotions and it drives us to action, there's less activity. It's really useful going back to that 1990s when Prozac, Zoloft, and Paxil came out because they said that people with, oh, I've got a slide for this. We're going to go to the general spot and go down to emotions, go to the <laughs> sorter, keep going down a few sections. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. I think it's 4A four, four or B or something like that, not reward. Slow down the emotion, not there. There's fight flight. I think it's, there we go, depression. Ah, go to this slide first. So this was like 1992 knowledge. So it's the outside of the brain. I have no reason why, I don't know why they colored the brain purple. But this is what's called a functional scan. Did you guys learn the difference between a structural scan and a functional scan? Okay, so this is an actual brain. If we have a picture that shows the physical structure, so an MRI, a CT scan, those kinds of things, and you look for damage. And so when I showed you the strokes, those were um, structural. These measure activity. So there's fMRIs. And I don't know how much you know about magnets, and that's how it works. So, and then a PET scan, a SPECT scan, those are all functional. So they're measuring change in activity. So you get into the machine, and they'll just measure you at resting. And then they'll expose you to something. And maybe this, they said, you know, oh, here, tells them, the, uh, oh, it doesn't say it there. But the, the activity is probably, oh, no, here they're comparing healthy and depressed brains. Sometimes um, it'll be like just resting, and then they'll show you gruesome images. And then they'll be resting, and it'll show you happy images, see what happens. It'll rest and show images you recognize, and once you don't, and then they can see where the activity is. So this is the group of healthy people, the average activity there. Um, and this is the depressed folks. Who has more activity? Right. Is it in the same basic areas? Yeah. And these are in some of the association areas where we're pulling things together. So this is really great knowledge, which was reasonably accurate. And in the 1990s, Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, and Celexa increased the amount of serotonin, one of the drugs in your brain, neurotransmitters. And so if this is the problem and we give you it, it it's great. Except, next slide, which is what I was telling you about, 
Later research shows that this area that I was pointing to is where we think about things, and this is more active in those with depression. On the outside, <laughs> where we go from uh, what I feel to what I do, less active. Now, do you know somebody who takes psychoactive medication, anything that changes, you know, for bipolar or, or depression or anxiety? How do you take it? In a pill. Does, can you get the pill to go to one side and not the other? If they had a syringe that went through the skull, you could. They're trying now with something called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And you guys, I don't know how much, are you guys like all health science majors or you just haven't taken biology or health science? So you know that sometimes, some of the new research, that the ways that they do surgery, they do it with multiple lasers so that the laser is not strong enough to burn it where the, the one line is coming, but where they like we'll have three, where it meets, the combined is hot enough to, to destroy whatever it is they want to destroy. Transcranial magnetic simulation, they're doing similar, they're creating small magnetic fields and trying to change it so that they can just change activity in one area. So theoretically they could do that, but that's not how it happens now. So this has been true uh, let's say since the mid to late 90s, and that's what, 20 some years ago? They, Prozac, Zoloft, that group is still like a seven billion, eight billion dollar a year industry. You don't hear, you hear commercials still talking about, you remember the old pill, the chemical imbalance guy? Yeah, look it up on old, there's a mad TV joke of it. Um, they, they, they got the money to, to explain and make better videos to learn, you know. And this is like, this is just like I said, 1998. I, I don't want to, oh, go to the next one and maybe it's the more, yes, this is, this is like a little bit later. This is like 2004. This is just showing slightly different areas. So this one I said, this blocks impulses. This is the one that we're meaning. This is one that's been implicated in ADHD, right? This is part of this inside limbic lobe. Um, and this is where you hold things in mind. This one doesn't work by itself. It takes information from here and from here and from here and coordinates and says, do I do this or that? And as you know, you could take the biology 240, 241 series or 241 two. You could do the biology, what is it, the 118, or you could do, was it the whole, no. There isn't a third different anatomy series, but you know there's often two or three different levels, you know. Uh, the pre-nursing series, the biology major series, and then the for the rest of us series that they suggest the psych majors take. Um, you can't make a decision unless you bring each one of those items into mind. What do they mean? What are the pieces? And then hold them together at the same time. So that requires activity in different little area, gray areas that are then shuttled quickly and coordinatedly well enough to the areas like number two up there so that they can be compared at the same time. So, yeah, that's the closest I got to bipolar, the depression piece at least. Are we good? Yeah. And again, if you want to, you know, put gloves on again and touch them. If you didn't get a selfie, do that. If you have any leftover questions, super. Otherwise, thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. It made a big difference. Thank you again to Kyle. Thank you again to Aaron.